I'm a kinetic artist, and I make sculptures that move. I have a hard time explaining to people what it is I do, so I brought an example, and I have a video clip. Thank you. I found I live in an alternate reality. And what I mean by an alternate reality is I, I picture every person is surrounded by a reality bubble. And that bubble is a mashup of everything they've done in their life, everything they've experienced, everyone they met. And as you walk around in this bubble, you bump into other people's bubble. And each time you do, you take a little bit of theirs, they take a little bit of yours. The idea of a reality bubble came to me when we adopted our daughter, Kayla. Kayla came to us from a past of neglect, but she was a survivor. She was an incredible survivor. She was a totally self-sufficient three-year-old child. When she came to our life, she had a reality that was much different than mine, and I could see that. But as she became acclimatized to our family, her reality changed, and it grew. You could see her bubble getting bigger, but all of her old experiences were still there. And if you know where to look, you can still see them. One of the things that worried me about Kayla when we adopted her is because of the situation of the uh, adoption, she wouldn't be able to know her birth mother or birth father. And I thought, boy, she's really going to miss this. And it turned out she could care less. I realized it was because I was looking at it from my reality. I knew my parents and my siblings, and if I didn't know them, I'd miss them. Kayla didn't miss them at all because she didn't know them. My reality is different than yours and yours and yours. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Many people say they can't fathom how I can do something like this. I can't fathom not doing this. I can't fathom how to be a that someone can be a doctor or a lawyer or sell insurance or real estate. My interest in kinetic sculpture started when I was just a little kid. My mom tells me she began to worry about me when at three years old she left me alone in the other room and I took my grandma's sewing machine apart. When I was seven or eight, I had what I thought was my crowning glory. It was my sister trap. In my room, I had a sewing thread across the doorway, black because you couldn't see it on the carpet. And when my sisters would come in and just touch that thread, it would knock over a can that I had sitting over there full of nails. It would come crashing to the ground. And then at the same time, the weight of that can would pull a string that went through some pulleys attached to my wall, through my desk, over to my tape recorder where I had drilled a hole in the switch and it turned it on, and it would say, get out of my room, get out of my room, over and over and over again. <laughs> my reality was brilliant. My sister's reality was that they didn't go in my room anyway. I think it was just too scary in there. So that eventually got taken apart for other projects. My first memory of using rolling balls was I went to a friend's house, and they had what I later learned was an Amish toy. Perhaps you've seen one of these. It's a rack, it's about this big, and has just wooden trails that a marble can roll down. It rolls down one side, drops through a hole, goes to the other side, drops through a hole. Sounds very simple, but it'll keep a kid occupied for hours. It did me. And when I and my friends got bored with this, we took our handful of marbles and we went outside. And near where we lived, 
there was a housing development where they had dug all these basements and they left these huge piles of dirt. And I would go out with my friends and we would build massive trails and tunnels all over this dirt. Much later, when I was going to the university for my art degree, I was taking a ceramics class and our instructor gave us an assignment to make something non-functional out of clay. I remembered that and I started to make these clay figures that had trails and tunnels for marbles. Clay didn't work very well for it because when the clay is wet, when you're making it, the ball doesn't roll at all. When it's fired and hard, the clay ball moves almost too fast. Clay also shrinks and warps and can crack. It was interesting, but only worked somewhat. When I graduated from the university, I opened a pottery and I made functional wares and sold them throughout the country at art fairs. That's how I supported my family. And I was always making my kinetic sculptures on the side, but it wasn't working really well because of the limitations of clay. I'd make one and have to throw 10 of them away. And then I had what I call my slap in the forehead moment. I was sitting at one of these art shows and across from me was a metal sculptor. And the metal sculptor had this form that was very similar to a form that I was working on my kinetic sculpture at home that wasn't working very good. And it just hit me. Just because I'm a potter doesn't mean I have to work in clay. It's kind of a no-brainer now. But, but I started working in metal and it all came together. Metal was malleable. If something didn't work right, I could bend it and form it. I could cut stuff off and add stuff. I could put motors onto it. I could put bearings. I could make it much more complicated. It worked really well. I started making a lot of these sculptures. After a point, my wife said, Jeff, you should, you should do a show with these. I resisted. And she said, Jeff, you should do a show with these. And I'm sure she was thinking, you're filling my house up. I'd like to have that space back. <laughs> I was thinking, I've never seen anything like this. Who would like this? Nobody would like this. And who would pay what I have to ask for these things? It takes so long. Well, when I finally applied to, sh to shows, within six months, I didn't have any time to do pottery anymore at all. <laughs> my wife helped me with my slides. Uh, <laughs> the reaction to my work dumbfounded me. It still does. When I was selling the pottery at an outdoor art show, if I had five people in my booth, I was busy. With my kinetic sculptures, I could have 20. 30, 40, or more people standing around looking at my work and wanting to talk to me. While I do have a few galleries that carry my work, I prefer to sell them at outdoor art fairs because I get to meet all of these people. And each one of these people, I get to bump up with their reality, and they get to bump up with mine. People are drawn to my work for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes I don't even know their reasons. Sometimes it's because they're an engineer or a tinkerer, or they just like my artistic interpretations, or it just brings back childhood memories. It helps me to think of the interactions with these people in a bubble reality concept. When I'm sitting at one of these outdoor art shows, I can have tens of thousands of people walking by me in a day. And unfortunately, I get asked the same three or four questions over a hundred times a day. My reality is, I've asked this, gotten asked this question a hundred times today. But what I've found I need to do is turn it around and look at it from their reality. It's the first time that they've asked it. I owe it to them as an artist to answer it honestly like it's the first time I've answered it. Just because they're asking it and everybody else has asked it doesn't make it not a valid question and it's the one they want to know. So I try and see things from their reality. I'm an observer. I like to watch people watching my work. Movement affects people in different ways. One of the things I like to do at an art show is just watch the crowd. Usually on a hot Saturday evening when everybody's been there all day, they're kind of stumbling along, just doing through the motion. But then they come to my work, it's like heads go up like a gopher and they beeline over to my booth. It's just fun to watch. It's hard to talk about motion because there isn't a lot of terminology for kinetic artwork. 
I found some, it's like a balancing act you're working with. When emotion is very slow and languid, it's soothing until it gets to the point of boring. If motion has a lot of changes in it, whether speed or direction, it's exciting until it gets to the point where it's almost too hectic. I found there's such thing as a um, satisfying motion and an unsatisfying motion. And I don't really have this nailed down yet, but what I think it has to do with is if the motion completes something or if it has a purpose to it. A good example of this is if you have a nail sticking out of a board and you pick up the hammer and then you set it down, it's not very satisfying. But if you pick up the hammer and hit the nail, it's satisfying. I see art as a window. Artists use their artwork to draw people into their reality. It's the things that are similar that the artists do to your reality is what draws you to their work. It's the differences that make it exciting, make it different and open your world. I had a friend ask an artist in my hometown, Charles Beck, a question and his answer always stuck with me. They asked him, what does that piece mean that you made there? And he just looked at him and he said, if I could just tell you what it meant, I would have written it down, it'd been a lot easier. <laughs> so when you look at artwork, look at it that way. People ask, well, what makes a art piece of artwork good? I think it's that being able to bring them into your reality. I look at the artwork in my walls in my home, and each one is a piece of that artist. I understand what they're seeing. And the art can transport you into that artist's reality bubble. And that's an artist's job, is to get you a little bit out of your reality and expand it. A good example of this are different types of artwork. If you think about the landscapes of Van Gogh or Monet or even Salvador Dali, they're extremely different and it's just little bits of those artist reality bubbles. In business, and I separate my selling business from my making of art, I found I have to use this also. What are the needs of my clientele? What are the wants of my clientele? How would they like to be treated? And I found most of all, I'm not offering a product. I'm offering a new reality to people. It's a little bit of my bubble. What I like most of all, when I'm talking with people, it's the kids. The kids start out with little tiny bubbles and they just expand before your eyes. My favorite story is a little boy that came into my booth named Ethan. He ran up into my booth next to a sculpture like this and sat right down in front of it, inches away from the bottom. And he just focused on the lift of the balls. He's just watching that lift. Probably for five minutes, his mother, who was very patient, sat behind him. And then she finally said, Ethan. And he didn't respond. He said, Ethan. I thought she wanted him to leave. And finally, he answered in that three-year-old voice, what? <laughs> and she said, Ethan, look up. And he looked up, and he saw this whole sculpture, and his mouth opened up, and he just said, wow. <laughs> Ethan's bubble expanded before my eyes. It was so much fun to see. It's one of the things I love about being an artist, just seeing this reaction to my work. I found I'm not selling a product. What I'm selling is growth, interest, excitement, curiosity, and wonder. This is what keeps my business unusual and successful. What I want to leave you with today is that business doesn't have to be just about business. It can be about a whole lot more. It's about understanding your clients, what their needs and wants are. Understanding what your needs and artistic wants are. And when you feed your artistic needs, don't just keep it, give it away. It's a whole cycle kind of thing. Bubbles bumping up against each other, colliding. Thank you.